On January 20th, 1961, uh, the streets of the Capitol were covered in eight inches of snow. When John F. Kennedy, the youngest man to ever be elected to the office of president, walked up to the podium without a hat and without a coat. Then in a speech comprising less than 1,500 words and lasting only 17 minutes, President Kennedy delivered a famous challenge to future generations that still echoes and inspires today. Ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. And with those two simple sentences, 17 words, he inspired millions of men and women to rise to the occasion, to be bold, to step up, not to consume, but to contribute. And today we find ourselves in a very similar moment such as this. And the truth is, uh, I don't know how today's going to go. But I do have a real sense that God is going to move. And God is going to do something that maybe, just maybe, you weren't even planning. To that end, I, I want to stop and pray one more time. And ask God to prepare our hearts. Would you pray with me? Father, we, we don't come to your word lightly. Father, let this not be a blow in and blow out kind of day. We would just go through the motions and really it's just, we got tunnel vision on something else and this is just a part of the traffic of our day. But Father, would you stop us? Would you send your Holy Spirit to arrest our hearts today? Father, would you make our hearts willing and receptive? Father, as I always pray, what we have not today, would you please give us? And Father, what we are not today, would you please make us? For your name, for your fame, for your glory, and for the joy of your people. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. If you're new today, you are in part four of a series that's actually stirring up our church in a pretty good way. Uh, and what we're doing in this message series is we're, we're learning to pray um, some new types of prayers, uh, new types of prayers. And the prayers that we're praying um, are, they're, they're not predictable, uh, they're not benign, uh, they're not mundane, they're not typical, they are not safe. What we are doing is we are learning to pray some prayers, some dangerous prayers. Uh, in fact, uh, I've been really blessed um, over the past couple of weeks just hearing from a couple of people that have been taking steps of faith to pray some new prayers. Uh, and so in week one, we learned to pray the prayer, search me, O God, search my heart, know my anxious thoughts and reveal my fears. In week two, we learned how to pray, show me, O God, show me my sin and lead me in the way of everlasting. And last week, uh, we talked about a very dangerous prayer where we prayed together, break me, God, break me, O God, break me of anything that keeps me from an intimate relationship with you. Uh, today, though, we're going to pray what may be my favorite of all of the dangerous prayers. Uh, we're going to pray the prayer of availability. The prayer of availability. Uh, and here's what I've noticed, and this is just based on observation, that um, every week many of you uh, will take one of these cards and you will fill out a prayer request. Uh, and we love it when you do. We love it. In fact, we have a, a team that is dedicated, full of people who love to pray over your prayer request. Uh, but here's what I've noticed, quite honestly, and this is just kind of an observation, that most of the time the prayer requests uh, that we get are prayers uh, for, for things that directly impact you or the people that you love. So uh, it's, God, would you do this for me? Or, uh, God, would you heal my friend? Would you help me get into this school? God, would you help me find a job? God, would you bless me as I do such and such? 
And absolutely and completely, 100%, we should continue to pray those prayers. But today, instead of just praying, God, would you do this for me? A dangerous way to pray is, God, what can I do for you? Not just, God, hey, can you do this for me? Can you bless me? Can you keep me safe? But, God, I am your servant, and I want to be available for whatever you might call me to do. I call it a prayer of availability. Uh, like I said, over the past couple of weeks, for some of you, uh, this will become an anchor message. Well, what is that? Uh, over your lifetime as a follower of Jesus, there will be certain messages that when you hear them, you encounter God in such a way that it literally changes the trajectory of your life. It changes everything to the point that you'll say, before that moment, I was such and such and did such and such. And when I heard that message, God spoke to me in a way, in such a way that I'm never, ever the same. I'm never the same again. The prayer of availability as we pray is a very, very dangerous prayer. So let me just tell you, let me just warn you. When you pray this prayer, God could direct you in a lot of different ways. He could lead you to a different city. He could reveal a calling to you that you never expected before. Uh, he may lead you to stay somewhere when you just knew that you were supposed to move somewhere. He may move you to break up with somebody and give you an upgrade. Hello, right? He might lead you to a different job. He might call you to serve somewhere. He might move you from being, I don't know, a cat person to a dog person. I don't know. I don't know what it could be for you. But when you make yourself available to God, it's an incredibly dangerous prayer that we're going to learn to pray today. Now, all throughout Scripture, from the Old Testament to the New, what you're going to see is that God calls people. Somebody say calls. Okay. God calls people. What does that mean? It doesn't mean your phone rings, okay? That's not what it means. It doesn't mean your phone rings, but it means that he speaks to people. He prompts people. He moves them. He leads them to say something or to do something, to go somewhere, to encourage someone, to speak truth. God will call on those that are his to do something that he wants done. And there are different responses to God's call. And today, I want to talk about three, just three of those responses that will lead us to our dangerous prayer. So three responses to God's call. The first one, if you're taking notes, is this. It was Jonah. Jonah responded to God's call this way. He said, here I am. I'm not going. Here I am. I'm not going. And maybe some of you can relate. Here I, here I am, God. I'm not going. Jonah chapter 1, verse 1. And two says this, God spoke and said to Jonah, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. What did Jonah do? Jonah ran. Jonah ran from the Lord. He said, Here I am. Here I am. I'm not going. And I wonder how many of you have had a similar experience. You felt prompted to, to do something. Hey, I'm supposed to reach out. I'm supposed to say something. I'm supposed to go help this person. Here I am, God, though not today. I'm not going. I know I have. In fact, if I can be honest, uh, I've had many moments, big moments, small moments, that I felt prompted to do something, to encourage someone, to stop and help someone. And regrettably, I missed it. I missed it. We all have. And to this day, I still feel bad about it. I felt prompted to do something, and I didn't do it. And I can guarantee you that all of you who are followers of Jesus, there are those times that God prompts you to do something, and you think, man, I need to. I am going to. I should. Here I am, though. Not today. I'm not going to do this. Jonah, here I am. Say it with me. I'm not going. The second one is Moses, and this is what Moses said. He said, here I am, send someone else. Here I am, God, send someone else. Send my brother, because this is not my perfect calling. And you can see this in, in verse 10 of Exodus chapter 3. 
God spoke and said to Moses, Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. I've been in Exodus for my Bible devotion time, and it has been amazing to get to reread this story. Now, something that's interesting is this is something that Moses would have agreed needed to happen. But instead of saying, sure, God, I'll go, Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? Who am I? Who am I? I'm not good enough. I'm not talented enough. Someone else would be better off doing this than I am. Here I am, God. Send someone else because I'm not the right person. And it's so easy for us to do this, right? Like, I'm not going to give. Like, they should give because they have more money to give. Or I'm not going to go. I don't, have, I don't have as much time as they do. Like, I mean, she can do it. Or he can do it, right? They've got more time. They're better equipped. I don't have the time for this. Here I am, God, but send someone else. Jonah says, here I am, God. I'm not going. Moses says, here I am, God. Send someone else. Isaiah, though, prays a very dangerous prayer. And this is the prayer that I want us to pray today. In Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8 says this, Isaiah says, And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Now, notice what Isaiah said in response back to God. Uh, first, notice what he did not say, okay? He didn't say, where are you sending me? Is the weather nice? What's the cost of living there? How are the benefits there? How much vacation time do I get? Is there paid time off? Right? He didn't say, Isaiah didn't ask for any of that. What he simply did, essentially, is signed a check that was blank and said to God, here I am. What? Somebody say it out loud. Send me. Send me. This is, I don't need to tell you, a really dangerous prayer. And I want to encourage you this week to make this a daily part of your prayer life. When you wake up, you say, God, here I am today. Send me. Here I am, God. I'm available to you. Here I am, God. You have permission to interrupt me. God, if you want me to go somewhere, I'll go. If you want me to stay, I'll stay. If you want me to say something to someone, I will speak today. If you want me to simply just be quiet and sit still and pray, I will pray. If you want me to give something away, if you want me to use my time, whatever you need me to do, whenever, wherever, God, I am completely available to you. I am your servant. I am your servant. Here I am, God. Send me. Send me. It's an incredibly dangerous prayer because when you start praying that, I can guarantee you that God is going to interrupt you. God will prompt you. God will move upon you. And suddenly you recognize that God has a lot of work for you to do when you start to open up your mind and are available to him and start praying, here I am. God, send me. So, how do we get there? How do we get that kind of attitude before God? How do we fully surrender our lives to God? I, I want to try to answer that. Uh, we looked at uh, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8, but I want to go back and look at the verses that lead up to that surrendered prayer from the prophet Isaiah. What do you need? To, fully, to be fully surrendered to God. Three things. If you're taking notes, I hope you'll write these things down. Number one, you need a genuine experience with the presence of God. You need a genuine experience with the presence of God. Verse one says this. In the year that King Uzziah died, he said, I, what? I, let's say it aloud, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. So what happened? Isaiah saw the presence of God. He saw him in all of his majesty, in all of his glory. 
And then the text goes on to talk about these angelic beings named seraphim and all of these angelic beings were kind of worshiping and praising the living God together. You remember what they were saying? They were saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And when Isaiah saw the presence of God, when he experienced the glory of God in that moment, it completely transformed who he was. Why is it that you might not be very available to God? Perhaps it's because you have not recently experienced the presence of God. Let me just say that again. Why is it that you might not find yourself being available? God, here I am. Use me today. Perhaps it's because you have not recently experienced the presence of the living God. You're too busy. You're distracted. You are consumed with the cares of this world. And here's the crazy thing that hit me this week. You can even be in church every week and still miss this. You can go to all the services. You can be on all the teams. You can do all the things. You can go to multiple churches, multiple experiences. And at the end of the day, you can be a full-time Christian, but only a part-time follower of Jesus. Come on, somebody. So I don't, I don't know what it could be for you. I don't. Uh, I don't know what's getting in the way. But I do know this, that God promises us that he is always available to us. Now, just listen to what James says in James chapter 4, verse 8. He says this. He says, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Isn't that good? Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. You see, God is not playing hide and seek. No, he is always available to us. When you draw near to God, he will draw near to you. So why is it that maybe you're not as available to God as you should be? Maybe it's because you haven't sought him in a while. Because when you experience his presence, you will be transformed. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. His glory was everywhere. So what do you need to be fully surrendered to God? You need a genuine experience with the presence of God. The second thing that you need is a genuine awareness of your sinfulness. A genuine awareness of your sinfulness. In fact, I'm going to argue that one of the biggest biggest cultural lies that people believe today is this. I'm a good person. I'm a good person. You're a good person. We're good people. She's a good person. He's a good person. We all got good hearts. I am a good person. How many of you have heard that, right? Let me just tell you this. Without Christ, you are not a good person. Remember Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. We looked at this a couple weeks ago. The human heart is what? Deceitful and desperately sick. Who can know it? Who can even understand it? We don't even understand our own heart. You see, apart from Jesus, you are not a good person with a good heart. You're not. You're wicked. I'm wicked. We're evil. We're sinners. Welcome to Relentless Church, where we make you feel good about yourself. Right? But it was when Isaiah saw the goodness of God that he realized the badness in him. That's not the right way to say that, but it felt good, so I said it that way. Isaiah saw how holy God was. And in that moment, he recognized his own unrighteousness. It was a genuine awareness of his sinfulness. In verse 5, he cries out, Woe is me. I'm lost. Right? Other verses say it this way. I'm ruined. I'm done. I'm nothing. I'm pathetic. I'm a sinner. I have nothing to offer. He's holy. I'm not. He's righteous. I'm unrighteous. He's full of glory. I'm full of sin. Woe is me. Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Woe is me, for my eyes have seen the king. 
So what does it take to get to a place where you are fully surrendered? Fully surrendered. Here I am, God. Use me. I'm yours. Send me. It takes a genuine experience with the presence of God. It takes a genuine awareness of your sinfulness. And number three, it takes a genuine understanding of God's grace. God's grace. When you understand just how amazing His grace is, it brings you to a point of full-on send it, surrender. Verse 6 says this. Isaiah said, Then one of the seraphim, that's one of those angelic beings, flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Then read this aloud with me, what what he said. This is the amazing news. This is the grace. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. What happened? He saw the presence of God. He recognized, I am I am undone. I am ruined. I am a man of unclean lips. And with one touch from the goodness of God, his sins were forgiven and completely atoned for. Now you can only imagine this, right? Your lying lips forgiven. Your lustful attitudes forgiven. Your self-centered thoughts forgiven. Your angerous outburst When you're driving, forgiven. Every secret sin you've never told anybody before, but God knows them all, forgiven as if they've never happened. God separates your sin as far as from the east as the west. He doesn't remember them anymore. Can I get an amen? Because when you confess your sins to God, he is faithful and just to forgive you of any sin. There's no sin that he won't forgive. None. There's no sin you can't repent of. He is faithful to forgive us. You see, when you understand the grace of God, it transforms everything. The same way that the coal touched his lips and removed his guilt, the blood of Jesus covers our sins. And when we recognize that we don't bring anything, but Jesus brings everything. Let me say that again. We don't bring anything And Jesus brings everything. When we sense God's presence, when we are aware of our own sinfulness, and then we experience the unmatched, undeserved grace of the living God through Jesus Christ, our only reasonable response is everything. Here I am, God. Send me. It's not my life. It's not my desires. It's yours. One of the most dangerous prayers you can pray is, God, I'm all yours. Anywhere, uh, anytime, any way, anything, I'm all yours. And this isn't some kind of, oh gosh, I, you know, I got to you know, pray this prayer because you know, Jesus died for me, shoot. No, this is, I, I get to do this. This is, I get to serve him. This is, I get to wake up tomorrow. I get to have another day that God has made. He's given me these gifts. He's put this moment in history. He's divinely placed me, uniquely wired me for such a time as this. Today, hello, today he's going to bring people across my path that I get to encourage because I have the encouragement of the Lord inside me. I get to lift some heads today because of what God has done to me. He's going to have people in my life that have needs. He's given given me everything that I need to bless their need. If I just have the courage to release it, God can use it. This isn't like, oh, I've, I've got to serve God. No, this is I get to serve God because he served me and loved me through Jesus. I get to give everything that I have to him. Now, why is it that more Jesus followers don't pray this prayer. It could be because they've never thought about it. Uh, I'm thinking it's probably because fear. They're afraid because it's a really dangerous prayer. Uh, Break me? Dangerous. Search me? Dangerous. 
Send me dangerous, dangerous prayers. My theory is this, though. I can't, I can't prove this, by the way, uh, but just from talking to people, I think there are many people that when they start to kind of pray this way, they think that God's going to send them to be a missionary in Africa, like where they don't have like real toilets or use real toilets, right? And, and here's what, what you need to know is that may happen. He may call you to be a missionary in Africa or Egypt or Turkey, but it, it's more likely Though that he's going to call you to be a missionary where you work, where you live, where you study, where you play. It's more likely that he's going to call you to serve the people that are right in front of you, to be faithful with what he's already given you. A lot of times God prompts us to just stop and listen to someone who's hurting. God, a lot of times will prompt you just to reach out and to just to give to someone who's in need. God may prompt you just to buy groceries for a single mom in need. And you may say, like, that's not really a big deal. And she would say, oh, no, that is a really big deal. And God would say, oh, no, that is a really big deal because you were faithful. You were obedient to me. And when you do these little things and are faithful to God, and you, you may wake up one day and just kind of realize that these were actually the big things. Because you are faithful to God just day after day after day after day. And when you've been faithful in the small things, guess what? He will trust you with some bigger things. One day you're excited. God, I'll go wherever you want me to go. Wherever you want me to go. And he will prompt you to serve somewhere in church. He may prompt you to serve, I don't know, in the kids' room. Where it's kind of like going to Africa. They don't use real toilets either. He, he may call you and lead you to become a community group leader. He may prompt you to start a nonprofit. He may prompt you to, to give above and beyond your tithe. I don't know what he's going to prompt you to do. But when you truly start saying yes to Jesus, you're going to recognize that he's calling you to do more and more and more and more because you are his hands and you are his feet in the world. Amen. Here I am. Send me. Here I am, Lord. Send me. Here I am, God. I am yours. Anywhere, any way, any time, anything. I am yours. And how do we get to that place where you have the courage to pray this dangerous prayer? How do you get to the, the courage to say, God, I don't need to know all the details? I don't need to be 100% sure. All I need to know is that you are calling me. And if you're calling me, the answer is yes. How do you get there? You truly experience the presence of God. You truly recognize your own sinfulness. And you truly experience the grace, the amazing grace and forgiveness that we have in our Savior, Jesus. And when that happens, you don't just try to. You get to give your whole life to God. So some people will say, God, here I am. I'm not going. Some people will say, here I am, God. Send someone else. But you, you are going to be different because you're going to experience him. And when you do, you can't help but say, here I am, God. Send me. Send so how do we close today? As we close, what I need to say is this. Not only does this have implications for you, but this also has implications for us as a church. So you're saying to God, God, here I am, send me. But we are also saying, God, here we are as Relentless Church. Send us. Send us. Use us. And so I want to close out today just by kind of sharing with all of you, what this means for us. Uh, so over the past 15 months, we have been praying uh, specifically around this idea of finding a location to call our own and to have morning services uh, to best serve the needs of our city. Um, and 15 months ago, uh, when we moved in here, we were believing in faith that this space would eventually become our home. Um, but during COVID, some things changed and some decisions were made. 
And about six months ago, we learned that we would um, have to stay here longer at this time uh, for this to become our home as the church that owns this building decided to stay here. Uh, and so we went back to the drawing board. We started praying again as a staff and as a leadership team and exploring our options for a new facility and a new place to call home. And today, I am happy to share with you all that God has answered those prayers. Take a look. Hey, church family, big news. We are moving. That's right. On March 27th, we are moving locations and service times. For the past 15 months, we have called 3535 West Georgia Avenue our home, and God has done some amazing things. And for the past 15 months, we have been praying and asking God for a facility of our own that God would allow us to have morning services to better serve the needs of our city for years to come. And God has answered those prayers. Today, I am standing at our new home at Pinsar Academy off of I-17 in Bethany Home. And on Sunday, March 27th, we will have our very first service in our brand new home with all new morning service times. How cool is that? We've still got a lot of work to do and we've got more details to come, but we are overwhelmed with excitement for what God has in store. So stay tuned, stay connected, and start praying about how God might be asking you to get involved and be a part. All right. God is good, amen. God is so, so good. Uh, that's right. So we are, as you heard, we're moving on March 27th to uh, Pensar Academy. And, uh, and so over the next uh, six weeks, we just wanted to make the announcement today, um, and we'll continue to make it. But over the next six weeks, we will be sharing with you more information um, every Sunday. So you do not want to miss a Sunday. You do want to be here as we share that information. Um, but as we close out today, let me just say this. Um, one of the biggest things that we need uh, to pull this off, to pull this transition off, to pull this move off, is we need your prayers. We need your prayers. We need your support. And we also need your help by joining a service team. Uh, because in order for us to serve all the people that we are believing that God wants us to reach, uh, we need our teams to be ready to serve all those people. Um, so I am asking you today to join a team. Like JFK style, right? Like ask not what God can do for you, ask what you can do for him. So don't just run out of here after the service. Um, uh, please stick around and visit our tables and join a team. Trust me, there is room for you on any of our teams. And if you're not sure where to plug in, like we can help you with that. We can, we've got a team that helps you get plugged in, but leave today on a team. So please help us make this move. Help us step into God's plan for us by joining a team today. You may have walked in here today a consumer, but I pray to God that you will leave here today a contributor saying, here I am, God, use me, send me. Let's pray. With every head bowed and every eye closed, Holy Spirit, I just ask that you would come. You would come and you would do a work that you have already been preparing our hearts to do. Father, I know there are men and women in the room um, that, that know you and love you and are serving you in all kinds of crazy ways. God bless them. I'm thankful for them. Father, I know that there are men and women in the room that are kicking the tires and, um, and they need to take a step of faith to start serving. Um, so God, would you encourage them? And Father, I know that there are men and women in the room that need to take a step of faith by trusting in you for the very first time. And Father, I pray today that you would give them the faith to believe that their eternal forever home today, today, their new address would be in heaven with you for eternity. So Father, begin to work throughout the rest of the service. Would you move and make decisions in the hearts of my friends? And God, would you call us uh, to be your servants? And God, may we be obedient to you with every step of the way. Father, let the, the cry of our heart be, here I am. Here I am, God. Use me. Send me. In Jesus' name. Amen.